Today we're gonna to talk about CDJs, which are the most common and the most standard bit of equipment found in DJ booths. Uh, CDJs are um, CD players for DJs. They were originally based on emulating old turntables, particularly Technics 1200s. So they have these big uh, jog wheels and platters, which behave quite similarly to how uh, a piece of vinyl on a turntable behave when you touch and move it around. Uh, they've been around for about 10 years now. The first CDJ that became popular and sort of started replacing turntables was the uh, Pioneer 1000. Uh, this is a new model of CDJ, the 2000. It's kind of the deluxe top of the range with all the bells and whistles. Um, so you're not necessarily going to find something this fancy in real life, especially in smaller clubs and smaller venues. But this does have all the possible features of CDJ, so it's an excellent uh, opportunity to demonstrate all the features different models have available to you. Uh, most booths, most venues no longer have turntables available. CDJs are very much the standard these days, so the majority of DJs are performing on them. Uh, people are switching over to laptops more heavily now. Obviously, a large part of this course will cover Traktor. And CDJs, particularly these new models, can be integrated with laptops and used as controllers for laptops, as well as being capable of playing uh, CDs or files of USB sticks or SD cards in their own right. These do have a, a CD slot still built into them, but it's becoming increasingly rare to actually use that. Most people are using uh, USB sticks, like the one I've got here. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few uh, generations they remove the CD players entirely. They're not the most reliable. So to start with, we're going to give you a comprehensive rundown of all the features of the CDJ2000. I'm just going to start at the top left and work my way down to the bottom right. And we're going to walk through pretty much everything on the surface, all the controls, and give you a brief explanation of what they all do. Now after we've gone the full rundown, I'm going to demonstrate to you the basics of cue points and beat matching with CDJs. So we'll show you the two CDJs I've got here. And we're going to demonstrate to you how to find the downbeat of a track or find the first kick number of a track, how to set up your cue points so you can play from there, and then how to get two tracks in sync. We will be using a mixer in this. Don't worry about what I'm actually doing for the mixer. Uh, the next lesson, uh, lesson three, is the full walkthrough on how this mixer works. So a CDJ2000 has three kind of essential sections to it. The first and the most important is this area down here. This area contains the jog wheel, the platter, that we'll talk about soon, the play pause button, the cue button, and the pitch fader, which controls the uh, tempo and thus the pitch of the music. Up here through the middle, we've got all the utility functions. So we've got our hot cues, our looping controls. We've got a touch strip that lets us move around through the track. We've got a few different settings for uh, how the jog wheels behave and how the CDJ behaves, what jog mode it's in. We've got the disc eject button up here. And then lastly, up here, we've got this nice big LCD screen that lets us browse around through uh, the tracks we've got available or uh, from USB sticks or from SD cards. It lets us switch between input sources and lets us see lots of useful information about the tracks. So from the top left, up here we have the uh, USB port, which is just a place for you to stick a USB key, as I've seen here. Now this USB key just has tracks put on it. However, you can use a piece of software called Recordbox that is produced by Pioneer. And this software will allow you to prepare a USB stick or an SD card in a way that means the CDJs can read it, somewhat like an iTunes library. The waveforms will be automatically loaded and all the data will be consistently available. We also have a slot here, just below that, for an SD card. Uh, people don't commonly use SD cards these days, but they are more practical than USB keys some of the time. So to switch to an SD card, you want to push the SD button here. And you can see I haven't got a card plugged in, so it tells me there's no card. Um, at the top, we've also got the link button. Now you can't see this, but on the uh, back of the CDJs, there is a USB port that allows you to connect the CDJ via USB to a laptop or similar. Now the most common uh, use for this would be to use the CDJ, for example, as a MIDI controller to control DJ software such as Traktor. We are going to be showing you in the uh, Traktor lesson later on how to set this up. But you can also use this to link two CDJs together via an Ethernet cable. There are various configurable, various options that can be used with the link. And the last button we have here is the disc button, which will load if I had a CD, which is inserted in the front in a bay here. If I had a CD in there, I would be able to load tracks off there. Along the top here, we have some utility functions, which I'm not going to go into now. But basically, there are some settings, there are some options about the CDJ, and some tagging systems that you can access via the menus up here. Most of the time, though, you'll be in the browse mode here. And in this case, we're going to be leaving it on USB mode here. 
There's this big knob here that lets us browse around, and just above it, there's a back button which lets us go up. So I can browse around my folders here. These are just uh, folders in the file system of my USB key. And for example, to go into the HeadFlux folder here, I just push this button in to go into this folder called Delete for some reason. I'll go in here, and then to load up a track, I can just hit that button there. You can see it flashing. Now, it takes the CDJ a little while to load up a track. So you can see the waveform here is not showing and the BPM information is not showing. So we'll give that a few seconds. You can see there, the BPM information is just shown up here and it's starting to draw a picture of the waveform of this track along the bottom of the CDJ here. When it's finished, it will tell me the total time here it will let me show what tempo change I've got. At the moment, I'm at negative 0.35% because the pitch fader is down a little. And it tells me that it's track five in the current playlist. So much like iTunes, this gives me kind of an overview of what's going on with this track here. Below that, we have the touch strip, which basically just lets us slide through a track like this. There's not much to say about that other than it's very quick. You can see the waveform here. So if I, for example, wanted to go to the breakdown of this track, I could simply slide through like that. Up on the top right, we have a number of kind of utility features. So at the top right at the back is the uh, power button, which is self-explanatory. Below here, we've got an unlock, unlock, uh, lock, unlock feature, which will just prevent discs from being ejected and so on when it's enabled. Below that, we have the disc eject button. There is no disc in here at the moment. I don't have any CDs, but if there was, that would obviously eject the disc. Here we have the vinyl speed adjust behaviors. Now, by default, um, and most of the time when you're performing, you'll have these all the way to the left on zero. That means when I play and pause a track like this, it starts playing and stops playing instantly. Now, back in the day when you were performing on vinyl, when a, a piece of vinyl is rotating, it actually has weight and momentum. And when the brakes are applied, you stop the turntable. It takes a little moment for the turntable to stop. And when you turn the table, turntable on, it has to uh, get all the way up to speed. So it starts slow and speeds up a little bit. So if I uh, turn the uh, start up to about there and hit play, you can hear that it takes a little bit of time for it to start playing. If I turn that up even more, you can hear that quite clearly. And the opposite is true of the knob above. This means when I stop playing, it will take a little while to slow down rather than turning off instantly. Now, like I say, most of the time you'll just have these turned all the way to the left, but they are there and for some specific effects and for some specific styles of DJing, people need to turn these up to emulate the style of the way uh, turntables behave. Uh, next to that, you've got some cue and loop recall functions, which I'm not going to go into too much detail on. But basically, this lets you uh, store cue and loop controls on a USB stick or on a uh, um, SD card and actually page through them and store them in memory. This is not something I see people doing all that often, but it is available to it. If you're performing consistently on CDJs, you can bring along SD cards that contain all your cue points and loop points preset. Below that, you've got the jog adjust button. This contains, controls the perceived weight or heaviness of the jog wheels. So from light all the way, which makes it feel quite lightweight, to heavy all the way up here, which makes it kind of heavier and a little bit harder to move. Uh, where you want to put that is up to personal taste, but it is worth playing around with that when you start playing with CDJs. Some people like them to be quite heavy. Some people like them to be quite light. It's just a tactile thing. Here you have the jog mode control. Now, traditional CDJs in the very early days of um, CDJs had behavior that was much like traditional CD players. So when you uh, paused a track, instead of it just stopping the way it does, uh, say a piece of vinyl that isn't currently playing stopped, it used to sound like this. It would actually stutter the play here to the point where it was paused and make this ticking noise. Now, new CDJs, like all of the, the good ones since the 1000s and the 800s, have vinyl mode, which behaves much more like a piece of vinyl. When it's stopped, it's silent. When it's playing, it's playing, and it's much more straightforward. I don't actually understand why CDJs still have a way to revert back to the old behavior, because it was horrible and it's not useful for anything as far as I know, but this control is here. So if your CDJs aren't behaving the way you expect them, do make sure you haven't actually switched it to CDJ mode by mistake. Uh, CDJ mode is just I've never seen it used, it's quite horrible. 
Now I'm gonna come back to the section up here, the hot queue and the looping section, once I've explained the core functionality, the most important features, which are all gonna be found down here. So the most important and first feature is obviously the play button. The play button is very simple, it's self-explanatory. You hit it, it starts playing the track, you stop hitting it, it stops the track, and it leaves the play head wherever that was. So again, if you imagine a piece of vinyl on a turntable, there's a needle that gets placed on that piece of vinyl. As it plays, the needle moves through. And when you stop the turntable, the needle stays at the point it last was. So when you start the turntable, it starts from that point again. Now, CDJs behave the same way. If you look on the waveform here, you can see, probably difficult to see, but there's a faint red bar on the waveform. And that indicates what's called the playhead, the current playhead position of the CDJ. So when I hit play, the playhead will start moving through the track. And as you can see, it turns white while it's playing. And if I hit play again, it will stop, but the playhead will have moved through. So the playhead is always at some point in the track. And when you hit play, you'll always play from where the playhead is currently at. Next to that, you've got the uh, platter. Now the platter kind of emulates the way turntables used to behave. Now, a, piece of turn, uh, a piece of vinyl on a turntable, if you put your fingers on and stop the vinyl, uh, the, the uh, device keeps spinning, the motor keeps spinning underneath it, but you can actually hold down the piece of vinyl and stop it from moving, so it slides over the top of the platter and doesn't move. And then you can actually move that piece of vinyl backwards and forwards underneath the needle, which will sound much like this. And obviously, since it's not playing, when I let go, nothing happens. Now, the CDJs behave somewhat like that. And this platter on the top is touch sensitive. So if I am playing a track, like so, if I hold down this platter, the CDJ detects that I'm touching it and will actually stop the track and let me move it around, much like holding down a piece of vinyl on a playing turntable and moving it around. When I let go, it will keep playing. However, around the outside is what's called the nudging section. Now again, on turntables, when you wanted to speed a piece of vinyl up slightly or slow it down slightly, you'll go to the edge of that piece of vinyl and either touch it a little bit, like push it forwards to speed it up slightly, or you'll just touch it and drag your finger on it to slow it down slightly. You'd make these very subtle changes around the edge to speed things up or slow things down. So the uh, platter around the edge of the, um, or the, the rim of the platter on a CDJ is not touch sensitive. So when I am playing a track, if I rotate the platter, it speeds it up. If I rotate it fast, you'll be able to hear that. And if I rotate the platter the other way, it slows it down. And that's used for nudging tracks forward or back. Now obviously, when uh, the, the CDJ is not currently playing, there's no difference between the outside and the inside of the platter. They both just move the track forward or move it back. But when it's playing, touching there will stop the audio. Touching here will not stop the audio. The next most important feature on the CDJ is the pitch fader. Now this, again, was is basically copied exactly from the Technics 1200 turntables. The pitch fader just changes the pitch. So speeding up or slowing down the playback of the uh, track also uh, pitches up or pitches down a track. When a track goes faster, it plays at a higher pitch. When a track goes slower, it plays a lower pitch. So this is called the pitch fader, even though it says tempo. And when you think about it as a DJ, you think about adjusting the tempo. And that's because tempo and pitch are closely related. So, so you can hear what that sounds like. Slow it down, slow, speed it up, or turn it to the middle. There's also a little button here called the tempo reset button that allows me to force it to uh, play at the original unchanged tempo of the track. So when that little green light is lit, it means this pitch fader is doing nothing and we're just playing the track at the original tempo. That's very handy when you know one track is at say exactly 134, exactly at 135 BPM. You can just put it to that, know it's exactly right, and then put your attention on the other CDJ when beat matching. Above the uh, pitch fader, you have two little buttons. The first is the master tempo, or you could also call that the pitch lock button. And basically, by default with a CDJ, when you pitch something up or you speed it up, the pitch gets higher, and when you slow something down, the pitch gets lower. Now, CDJs have built in algorithms that try and compensate for this effect so that you can speed up or slow down a track without changing the perceived pitch. 
These algorithms are not perfect, so when you speed up or slow down a track with master tempo switched on, the audio quality will slowly decline, and the further away from the original tempo you put it, the more the audio quality will decline. But there are some situations in which the slight loss to audio quality is less of a problem than the pitch change. For example, when two tracks are in a, the same key, but two, one, they're both playing at slightly different tempos, one at say 134 and one on 135. If they're both at the same key, but one of them is slowed down and just pitched down to uh, get the beat match in sync, then those tracks will go out of key, which some of the time will sound horrible. So the master tempo, the key locking, is a way of dealing with that and keeping the pitch consistent. So you can hear the difference. <laughs> you can hear the uh, difference in pitch or perceived pitch when I turn that on. The next button is just the pitch range. Now, by default, when you switch a CDJ on, it will let you go from plus 10% speed to minus 10% speed. However, you can actually change the range. I can go to plus 16, it showed there. I can go to what's called wide, which means, well, you'll be able to hear, but no speed there and really fast there. Wide is not useful for performing at all, but it's really nice for kind of fancy effects and stuff. There are lots of tricks you can play with the wide setting on CDJs. You can often um, have a note in the CDJ and you can actually tune the note up and down and play melodies by hitting the Q button, which we'll talk about in a moment, and adjusting this pitch fader. And lastly, we can do it to plus or minus 6%. Plus or minus 6% is where I usually leave a CDJ with the simple logic that if I'm moving a track more than 6% up or 6% down in tempo, I'm actually moving it too far. And either if pitch lock master tempo is on, the audio quality is gonna get destroyed or it's gonna be too low or too high. So I often put it to plus or minus 6% just so that there is a limit to how far it can go either way, and also so that the range of this pitch fader is only a total of 12% say, versus, say, a total of 20%. And so each change I make is more precise and more accurate. It gives me more precise control over each increment of pitch as I change it. Now, the next feature that you'll find on a CDJ, and something you're using constantly, is what's called the Q button. Now, there are two different things in DJing that are called queuing. This confuses a lot of beginning DJs. So, on a CDJ, queuing is essentially a marker, like a bookmark, on the track you've currently got loaded. Um, that, that marker or that bookmark is called the queue point. And the queue button is a way of going to that point in the track, playing the track from that point, or setting a new point, setting a new bookmark. Whereas by comparison, what we'll talk about in the next lesson, queuing on a mixer is about sending audio to your headphones and is about pre-listening to tracks before they go out the uh, house system. It's unfortunate that there are two different things that are both called queuing and it's spelt the same way, but think about it that queuing on a CDJ is different from queuing on a mixer. They're just both called queuing. So explaining what the queue button does is slightly complicated because it's context sensitive. Once you get used to this Q button, it is very cleverly designed so that it does exactly what you need it to do. Um, no matter what you're doing or where you are, it always does what you need it to do. But it can take you a few tries and a little bit of memorization to remember all the different things the Q button does, depending on where it's at. So firstly, when dealing with the cue button, you have to understand auto cueing. Now auto cueing is a feature that's built into newer CDJs and basically what it does is when a track's loaded into the deck for the first time, the CDJ will try to find the first downbeat or the first kick in that track and it will put the cue point on what it thinks is the first kick or the first downbeat automatically. So if we've just loaded up this track, which I will do like so, we can see we already have a cue point loaded up. You can see on the screen there is a little orange marker, which in this case is right under the white playhead marker, that indicates where the cue point is currently at. We can see we're currently at the cue point because the uh, orange ring around the cue button is currently lit and not flashing. That means the playhead is currently on the cue, so we're in the first mode. Now, if we listen to this, 
We can hear that the CDJ has in fact found the first downbeat. I know this track and I know it always finds it. Now the CDJ doesn't always get this right, especially tracks that have ambient intros or strange things happening in the beginning. It may get it wrong, but most of the time it will get it right. It just pays to, whenever you load up a new track, a new track do double check that cue point and make sure the CDJ's guess is correct. Um, I'd say it's, it's right kind of 80 to 90% of the time, and when it's not right, you just have to go in and set that cue point yourself manually. So the cue button has kind of three modes or three different things it does. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, the fact that this, but this button is lit up and not flashing means that the playhead, this white marker, is currently in the same place as the cue, which or the cue point, which is this orange marker. And this means when I hit the cue button, it will start playing from the cue point. When I let go of the cue button, it will snap back to the cue point. It will snap the playhead back to the cue point. It does the same thing with the jog wheel. If I move the jog wheel forward, when I let go, it will snap back to the cue point. So this is commonly used when you're beat matching. If I had a day track playing on the other deck and I wanted to mix this one in, I would be listening. I would bring the track in like this. I would determine whether it was going too fast or too slow. I'd make some adjustments. I'd let go. I'd wait until the next downbeat and then I'd start again. So it lets me play the same section from the cue point over and over again until I get the tracks locked in and everything sounding right. Now, the next mode we have is when the uh, cue point and the playhead are not at the same point. So if I play and pause that track briefly, that means the playhead has just moved ahead slightly. And you can see now the uh, playhead marker is red. Um, we're in what's called needle mode, which is to indicate that uh, we're not at the cue point. And we can also see that the orange ring around the cue button is flashing. This means if we hit this cue button, it will actually move the cue point to the current playhead position. So if I go ahead and hit that, you can see it stops flashing. The cue point is actually moved slightly. And now we're back to the first mode, but you can hear it's not standing, or it's not starting on the first beat. And we wanna move it back to the first beat. We'll find the first beat by scrubbing through the track with the platter like this. You can hear that I'm finding that first kick there. And then I hit that cue button again to move it. So that's another little subtlety is when we're in cue mode, if we want to move that cue forward or backwards, we can actually adjust the position with the platter. I move it to the snare here. And as long as we keep our finger on the platter, keep that held down and hit cue while it's held down, the cue point will still be moved. And you can see I've moved it to the snare and then I can move it back to the kick there. Now that is relatively straightforward. The last mode we can be in is when the track is currently playing. So if I start playing this track, if I hit the cue button, it will take us back to the cue point and it will stop playing the track. So it will pause the track. So playing, back to the cue point and paused. So those are the three core modes of what a cue point does. Now this, this is very cleverly designed. Uh, one of the things you'll find about this is while this may seem confusing at first, when you start performing on a CDJ, you'll rapidly discover that the cue button pretty much always does exactly what you need it to. No matter where you are, it's always set up to behave in the way you need. So it may seem like a tricky thing to keep track of and like you're gonna get confused, but after a day or two of practicing or even a few hours, you'll very quickly realize this is a very intuitive system and actually moving cue points around and using cue points is very straightforward, very simple. Above the uh, cue point button, we've got these two groups, uh, four buttons total, the search and the track search buttons. The track ser the search buttons, the bottom ones, are essentially like the fast forward and rewind buttons on CD players. As you can see, they simply fast forward through the track and you can see the playhead marker is moving. So I can fast forward and then, you know, just for kicks, I can move the cue point there. So now I've got the cue point all the way through the track. Now, people don't tend to use these uh, controls very much anymore because we now have the uh, needle strip up here, which is slightly more useful just because you can see what you're doing. But you can fast forward and rewind as you like. The next two buttons up are like the next and previous buttons on a CD player. So if I hit next, it will load up the next track. If I hit previous, it will either, if we're in the middle of a track, it will go back to the start of the track. And we're at the start of the track, it will load the previous track. So if I play this for a moment, so we're in the middle of the track, 
If I hit track search, it will take me back to the start of the track. And it's also quite smart. So when I hit that track search and go back to the start of the track, it will actually run the audio cue functionality I talked about earlier, and it will reset that auto cue. So if I move this cue point to some silly place, you know, not on a beat or anything like that, and I want to take that auto cue or that cue point back to the start of the track, back to where the auto cue found it, I could just hit track search like that, kind of reload the track, and the audio cue gets reset. Quite simple. Above that, we have the direction switch, which is pretty straightforward. While we're playing, if this direction switches up, we're playing normally, fourths. If I switch it to reverse, the CDJ plays backwards instead of forwards. Uh, there are some creative and useful effects uh, different performers use this for. The reality is, most of the time this will be switched into forward, and if it's playing backwards, this is just something to check for if you're not aware that this exists. Every now and again, people accidentally toggle it and then get confused as to why their tracks don't sound right. All right, the next section we have on the CDJ is the hot cue section. Our hot cue sections are only found on the more expensive, the, the higher model CDJs, but they're very useful and they can actually be, like I mentioned earlier, stored onto SD cards and things like that. So if you have a collection of tracks you play with commonly, you can set up hot cues, uh, potentially in record box, which I mentioned earlier, and the CDJ will automatically load those cue points. For example, I commonly set up hot cue points to the start of the track, the first kick drum, the first bass drop, and potentially the first breakdown. So that I have these kind of bookmarks or shortcuts I can skip through all my tracks with. Now the hot cue functionality is very simple. We've got two different modes, either store mode or set mode, and recall mode or I guess use mode. So um, if I wanna put a uh, hot cue down, I can for example scroll through there until I find this kick here, and then I can hit that hot cue button. You can actually see there's a little A there, which indicates that the hot cue has been set there. If I then go back into hot cue use button, you can see that first hot cue, A, is now lit green to say that I have a hot cue in that slot, whereas B and C are currently unlit, which says I don't have a hot cue in that slot and there's nothing, nothing will happen when I hit those buttons. Now, the hot cue buttons are much simpler than the cue button. They don't have all the mode switches, they don't have all the um, contextually specific stuff. So literally, if I hit hot cue A, it will go back to hot cue A and it will start playing. Relatively straightforward. And if I'm currently playing, if I hit hot cue A, it will go to hot cue A and it will just keep playing. So you can quickly shuffle around in a track, you can move around and it will keep playing. Whereas obviously with this cue, often called the floating cue, I'm um, down here, if I hit that cue button while we're playing, it will go back to the cue button and it will stop. So hot cues are good for bouncing around a track, um, manipulating, and they're good to have kind of stored bookmarks at different points in a track. And if I want to replace that hot cue, I simply scroll through to a new point here and hit it again. And it will just store it in a new place. Very straightforward. The next section we have here is the looping section. So I'm gonna take us back to the start of the track. Now the looping is really quite straightforward. Now the, the CDJ 2000s and the newer model CDJs are relatively intelligent and they will actually automatically snap loop points and so on to what it thinks is the nearest downbeat. There's actually a, a control for that buried in the menu. Uh, so that means it's relatively good about setting up loops that are perfectly on time and will loop seamlessly. And to set up a loop, we basically have the in and the out button. The in sets the start of a loop. Then we hit the out button, that sets the end of a loop. And so it'll be a length of whatever time or period you waited for. So we're gonna do, say, a two bar loop. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three, four. So you can hear there is a two bar loop there. Now the timing on these things, while it's relatively good, is often a little bit imperfect. Uh, if you've gone and prepared your tracks in advance with the record box software, uh, the, the CDJ will have a better idea of where the beats are and it will be able to get perfectly quantized or snapped loops. But when it's just guessing, when it's just trying to work it out, uh, sometimes the timing will be a little bit off. So you have to get your timing when you hit these buttons just right. You can also exit the loop by hitting the re-loop or exit button. And lastly, there's this little button here which starts with a four beat loop or a one bar loop. 
So, and every time I hit that once the loop's up, it'll half the length. So you can see, every time you hit that button, it will cut the loop into half the length, which if you get your timing right, can be used for those kind of loop roll build-ups and so on that DJs commonly use. All right, lastly, we're gonna show you the basic mechanics of beat matching with CDJs. Now, beat matching is something that can't easily be taught or can't be taught completely. Obviously, I can show you all the basic tools you need to know in order to be able to perform a beat match. And I can give you some advice and some guidance on the workflow you might use and what sort of things to listen to. But fundamentally, beat matching is about ear training. It's about learning to hear uh, whether two tracks are playing at the same time or not, and learning to kind of intellectually separate two tracks that are both playing through your headphones at the same time. So you can think about one, you can think about the other, and you can see what they're doing separately. This is kind of a, a skill you just learn through practice, through a lot of patience and persistence. It's not something anyone can tell you how to do. And so when you first start to try and do this, uh, you will have some issues. It will just take you a while to get it. It will, may look easy when someone who knows what they're doing does it, it's because they've had a lot of experience and they can hear things clearly that you can't. So just spend hours and hours practicing and you should be able to get it. Now the workflow we're going to use here is pretty simple. I'm going to play this track here on Decade. This is a Hit Flux's remix of Take Control. And we're just going to have that playing from kind of the main drop, so the last section out. And while that's playing, we're going to, on this track here, uh, Hit Flux and Neurodriver collaboration called Energy Vibration, we're actually going to... Uh, bring in uh, this track. So firstly, we're gonna set the cue point on the downbeat if the auto cue has not set it already. Then we're gonna use this cue, like so, to overlap this track with this track and determine whether it's playing at the same tempo or not. This one's kind of easy for me because I happen to know what tempo they're at, but that's all good. And then we're gonna keep playing from this cue point and adjust this pitch fader, listening through our headphones and to determine whether this track is playing slower or faster and slowly kind of play a game of hotter or colder, narrowing in on the tempo until the tempo is playing at the same speed. Once we've got these two tracks playing at the same speed, we're gonna wait until kind of the end of this track here or the last phrase of this track here. We're gonna bring this track here in and we're gonna use the platter, the uh, nudges around the edge of the platter, to uh, speed this up slightly or slow this down slightly for a moment just to bring the kick drums and the snares into line. My reflexes are only human, you know, they're only good to 15, 20 milliseconds. So when I bring this track in here with the cue button, I'm never gonna get it perfectly in time with this track here. If I was more awesome, I probably could, but I'm not that awesome and I can't. And so when I bring in a track here, I always need to make a little bit of an adjustment here to make sure that those kicks are perfectly in sync and just listen through my headphones to make that happen. And lastly, once I've got these two tracks playing in sync and I've got them lined up with each other, I've got this one playing from the start of uh, the last phrase here or the second last phrase here, more on phrasing later in the course if you're not familiar with that term. Then I'm gonna switch you over to the PA or the master output of my mixer and you're gonna hear me bringing up the volume of track B and then bringing down the volume of down or Deck A, Deck B, Deck A. Uh, this will not be a particularly clean mix because I'm not using any of the EQs or anything on the mixer here, but don't worry about that. The next lesson we're gonna talk about are all the functions on the mixer and explain how to really polish and finesse that mix. So, uh, one last little thing. You'll notice that the waveform here is missing or partially missing. That's a uh, bug in the CDJ2000. Sometimes they don't fully load the uh, waveform of a track. It's one of the issues with them. So you can see here it's loaded the first part of the waveform and forgotten about it. It can still play the track just fine and for what we're doing, which is beat matching by listening, this doesn't matter. But if you can get confused by the way this looks, that's what's going on there. So we'll start with by putting on my headphones, which you are going to be listening to for the time being. Uh, and then we're gonna play this track here from kind of the main drop. All right, now I'm gonna turn the volume of that down to my headphones. Don't worry about how I did that, more on that later. And I'm just gonna listen to this. I'm gonna make sure that I can find the first kick drum. Sounds like it's there. There we go. So I've got the cue point set to the first kick drum of this track on deck B. Now if I bring back up the uh, volume of uh, Take Control, I've got my headphones on all the way. 
One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now you can see I'm slowing down the platter and that's keeping them in sync, which means that this is going too fast and I need to lower the pitch fader. Still too fast. Sometimes if I hold down that cue button for too long or it drifts too far out and it's too confusing, I can no longer hear what's going on. I simply let go of the cue button. I let this track play for a moment and then I bring this back in, back in sync. So I just kind of let go and replay in sync so that everything is uh, lining up again, at least to start with, and I can hear what's going on. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now they're going at the same speed, but they are out of phase. The kicks are not lining up, so I'm using the jog wheel here to knock those kicks. And now, you're going to be listening just to the main output. You can hear, those are pretty much perfectly in sync. Now, that's not obviously a particularly elegant mix because we got almost to the end of the track here. We only had one eight bar section left. I bought the start of this track in once I had everything synced up just on that last, last eight bar phrase. If I was trying to do a proper mix, I would have got that beat match happening much earlier. Obviously, I would have done it much faster because I wouldn't have been talking about what I was doing. I can do this in kind of 15, 20 seconds, no problem. And then I probably would have bought this track in say 16 or maybe 32 bars before the end of this track exactly when, relatively straightforward. So that's a quick example or a quick demonstration of the workflow of beat matching. One track is playing, find the downbeat, find the cue point for a section that's easy to beat match. A section that's just drums or just drums and snares is usually best, it's very clean, it's very clear. When you're learning to beat match, when you're practicing, do start with tracks that are very simple, there's not much going on, so that you don't get confused trying to filter out or ignore all the other sounds that are happening. Find the cue point, use that cue button to uh, bring this track in, to start with in sync with this. So, you know, play the uh, Q button here in sync with the downbeat of a bar here. And then listen to see whether it drifts out of time, it's going too fast or too slow. You won't be able to hear whether it's too fast or too slow, it will just sound wrong to start with. But over time and with practice, and with a certain amount of intuition for it, you'll be able to hear. If you think it's going too fast, check that by slowing it down a bit with the platter. Don't do it too much and see if that fixes it or makes it worse. If you think it's going too slow, do the opposite. So uh, if you think it's going too fast and you slow it down a little and it brings it back into sync, it is going too fast, so then adjust it down and then lower the pitch fader slightly and get a little bit closer. It's like a game of hotter and, uh, hotter and colder. You narrow in on the two tracks playing at the same tempo and the closer you get, the easier it is and the more precisely you can listen, the more precisely you can get it. One last thing is uh, when you think you've got them in sync, do make sure to uh, listen for a little while. Sometimes tracks are slightly out of sync, and while they sound in sync for the first sort of four bars, by the time they get uh, eight bars in or maybe 16 bars in, they've drifted and they sound out of sync again. So you can, if you've got time, it's worth just listening to that track for quite a long time and then making sure that if there are very small, tiny little adjustments to the pitch fader that need to be made, you get an opportunity to put those in. Of course, if you don't have time for that, if this track is kind of reaching the end, you can sometimes just play this one and then listen very carefully for those changes and adjust for them with the jog wheel while they're playing. And this is something that DJs do a lot. The downside of that is that if you've got other people who have good ears in the audience, if both faders are up and you know both tracks are playing at once, if you can hear that they're going slightly out of time, the audience can hear that they're slightly going out of time. 
you're much more critical and much more educated, so you should be able to hear before they do, but do be aware that if, if you can hear it, they may be able to as well. So it's better to get things perfectly in sync with the headphones and only ever play things out when you know that everything's gonna be super tight and polished.